If you're a guest with us or maybe you're here with family, we especially want to welcome you. And for those that are joining us online, it's a joy to have you with us. It has been a fantastic weekend of celebration. We, uh, we gathered on Friday night for our Good Friday service. I just want to put a plug in. You know, this is something we've been doing relatively new over the last couple of years. And, uh, boy, it's become a, a really, along with uh, Christmas Eve, one of my favorite services. And uh, I want to thank publicly uh, Devon White, Brian Heckman, for presenting, if you will, the, the passion of the Christ as told by the Gospel of John on Friday night. So thank you for being with us. But what an opportunity to continue to celebrate the goodness and of God and his resurrection as we gather together here in person on this Sunday morning. We've been running a theme over these last few weeks leading up to today. I'm going to kind of finish this off by bringing the message to you today. And we've been talking about how Easter changes everything. Easter itself, the resurrection of Christ, changed everything in the world for you and I. I was thinking about this, and, you know, when, when we get to certain events throughout the year, we have these certain, I think, images that kind of come to mind. If I said birthday, what image comes to your mind? Might be what? Birthday cake or candles, something along those lines. Sometimes party hats and balloons, those things kind of come to your mind. If I said Christmas, however, which is the birthday of Christ, other images might come to your mind. You might have an image of a nativity, right? And uh, as we have expressed through Jesus uh, being born into the, to the stable and being in the manger, we see that kind of an image. Or a star over top, you know, the bright star that, uh, that guided them there to see Jesus. Those are kind of some images we think of when we think of Christmas. However, when we think about Easter or Resurrection Sunday... We often think of what? The cross. And uh, rightfully so. Uh, the cross is the image. It represents what? It was a price that was paid. It was a sacrifice by Jesus when he went to the cross. And today we have an illuminated cross uh, here to, to my left. It has the, the white cloth on it. Represent Christ is no longer on the cross, nor is he in the grave. He is resurrected. But the cross itself represents for you and I the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. In fact, the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 9.22 tells us this, that it had to happen because without the shedding of blood, there would what be? There would be no forgiveness or remission of sin. I thought about it, how many of the hymns and the songs that have been written over the years that point to the cross, not only does it recognize and acknowledge sacrifice on Christ's part, but for you and I, when we think about the cross, it is the place of what? It's the place of surrender. We often will talk about that when you come to the cross, when you come to the place, it is representation of the place of surrender. When you surrender your life to him, or even as a believer, and I would say it this way, at times you and I need to be reminded that it's at the cross or the place of surrender that we can leave everything, all of our doubts, our fears, our worries, anything that's going on in our life, we can surrender to the Father at the cross or at the place where we surrender through prayer and petition the needs in our life. So the cross represents sacrifice, and it represents surrender. Think about some of the songs that have been written over the years, some of the old hymns. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I'm happy all the day. We sang a song on Friday night, which is a very traditional hymn that is, uh, again, acknowledged at this time of the year especially, but it was called The Old Rugged Cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for the world of lost sinners was slain. I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last lay, I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and I will exchange it someday for a crown. More current version or song that was made famous by Hillsong was, at the cross I bow my knee where his blood was shed for me, right? It is representation of not only sacrifice, but the cross is a representation of your and I and a place of surrender. When I think about other images of Resurrection Sunday, we think of what? The empty tomb. 
We have the cross, but we also have the empty tomb. Oftentimes, if you see a photo or an image that's created of the tomb, oftentimes there's a bright light shining out of that, representing what? Victory. It's representing Jesus is no longer there. So we understand that the tomb, the empty tomb, if, if the cross represents sacrifice and surrender, the tomb itself represents victory. And I would even say this, fulfillment of prophecy, both in the Old Testament and the New Jesus had told the disciples and the religious leaders of the day, and they kind of pitched a fit about this, but he said, you can destroy this temple, but I'll raise it up again in three days. So the cross represents a fulfillment of God's promise and his prophecy. Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 through 57. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you and I, as we gather here on this Sunday morning and we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are celebrating victory over the power of sin in our life. The cross, the empty grave. But there's another image that for me, and I was talking with Holly here yesterday afternoon, and we were just sharing. She was preparing to teach our kids today, and, and I was preparing to speak for you as well. And I, I began to share with her, you know, there's another image that's had a profound impact from, on my life. And, you know, about 20 years ago, and I've shared this with you before, but Mel Gibson released the film, uh, The Passion of the Christ, right? Anybody see The Passion of the Christ? And my wife has seen it one time like this. And uh, that was it. It was enough for her. And, uh, but in that film, there was one scene that I thought, when I think back to that film, there's just one specific scene that stands out to me. And that was the point where Jesus surrendered his life on the cross. And at that moment, there was a single teardrop that, if you'll remember, fell from heaven. And when that teardrop hit the earth, the earth began to shake. And at that moment, for me, something very significant happened. And that was the veil in the temple was rent or torn in two from top to bottom. So as I think about Resurrection Sunday and all that Christ accomplished, yes, I celebrate and think about the cross. I certainly celebrate the empty grave. But oftentimes, I want to come back and I want to think about the impact. What did it mean? When I think about how Easter changed everything for us, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ, I come to this veil and I think about what does it imply for you and I today. I want to share the story, and of course, the crucifixion and the story of Christ, death, burial, and resurrection is told in the Gospels. I want to choose Mark chapter 15 to share this story with you today. But from Mark chapter 15, begin reading for you in verse 33. The scripture tells us, as the story picks up, that at noon darkness fell across the whole land until about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And then at 3 o'clock, Jesus cries out with a loud voice, Elo, Elo, Lama, Shabbatani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me or abandoned me? And some of the bystanders under, misunderstood, and they thought that he was calling out to the prophet Elijah. And one of them actually ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up on a reed stick so that he could drink. Wait, he said, let's see whether or not Elijah comes to take him down. And then at that time, Jesus uttered another loud cry, and he breathed his last. Verse 38, and the curtain or the veil of the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the Roman officer who was standing there facing him saw that he had died, he exclaimed, this man truly was the son of God. So why? Why the veil? What did it represent? Why in the temple? What does it mean for you and I today? What is the image that we see? What is the takeaway from this veil being torn in two. And I think if you and I are going to really truly understand the purpose of the veil and what it means today for you and I, we have to understand some things. We have to understand what is the effect of sin, what is the nature of God, and then ultimately what was the impact of the cross. 
When I think about sin, it doesn't take long to understand that sin itself at its very core separates us from the heart of the Father and all that God intended for us. In fact, who God really intended you to be from the very beginning when he created us. If you go back into the garden from the beginning of Genesis, we see that God had created man in his image. His desire was to have fellowship with him, to walk with him, to know him intimately. He creates Adam and Eve in his image, creates a place for them, puts them in the garden, gives them just but one commandment. Don't eat of this tree. And yet, we get into chapter 3 of the book of Genesis, and we understand that there's an adversary. That everything that God created and that is good, every, all of the attributes that define who God is, there is a counterfeit to that. There is an adversary, and his name is what? Satan, the devil, Lucifer. Listen, can I help you out? He's not an imaginary event He's not someone who does not exist. He's not a cartoon character. This is absolutely the enemy of the Father that we love. And everything that God created to be good, he has a counterfeit to that. If God is light, Satan is darkness. And Jesus came to rescue us out of darkness, being brought into and back to the marvelous light. He is good. Satan is evil. Everything that God created for you and I to walk in the fullness of that, Satan has a counterfeit. Satan wants you to, he wants to rob you and has robbed us from the time we're born of our identity and who we are as a child of God. But Jesus came to restore and redeem that. Sin separates us. In fact, Paul would write it this way in Romans 6.23, for all have sinned. You're kind of born with this sin nature DNA in you. That's how you come into the world because of the fall of the first Adam. The fall of Adam brought sin into our life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus defined it like this. There is a thief who wants to kill, steal, and destroy you. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So we see that from the very beginning and the stories that are told all throughout the scriptures, we see that sin separates us from the love of the Father. But God is so good in his mercy. His love is so broad for us that from the very beginning when man sinned, he began to initiate a path to recovery, redemption, reconciliation for you and I. He did that because he's what? He's a holy God. He's a loving God. He has developed a way by which you and I can walk in relationship with him. There's also this context by which we are to worship him, and we are to worship him. Jesus would later say we have to worship him in spirit and in truth. See, we don't come to God and we, wor- we don't come to him and worship him on our terms. You don't get to define, I don't get to define how I'm going to worship him. In fact, the scripture tells us exactly how we are to worship him. He wants to have first place in our life. He wants to be at the core. The way we like to say it around here, you have to invite Jesus to be only in your heart, but the very center of your life. Everything that you have need of is found in your relationship with him. And when you commit to him, he empowers you in every other aspect of your life. But we also know this. Again, there's a counterfeit. There's a thief. In fact, take you back to Genesis for just a second. I want to mention this. You know, think about the DNA that was passed down from Adam and Eve, even to their children. Chapter 4 in Genesis tells us that they, get, they had children named Cain and Abel, and it says that even Cain, in the course of time, is the way it says it there, in the course of time, he brought a gift to the father. He brought some of the produce from the lamb that he had cultivated. But Abel brought a perfect lamb. He brought the firstborn lamb. He brought the perfect one to sacrifice for Christ. And it said that God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but he rejected Cain's. And, of course, the story goes on that Cain, in his rage, then took the life of his brother. Why? Cain did not understand that he's serving a holy God. That God has set the standard by which we worship him. The book of Hebrews kind of defines it like this and gives us, you and I, we have to understand how do we please him. It is faith that pleases him. The writer says in verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 11, and it is impossible to please God without faith. 
And anyone who comes to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely or diligently seek him. That is how you please your heavenly Father. We have faith in him. We put our trust in him. We invite Christ to redeem us, and then we follow him in his word all the days of our life. I've always defined in my simplistic way this term faith. What does it mean to have faith in God? Walk in complete obedience. When you and I just embrace the truth of God's word, he will restore you, he will redeem you, he will reconcile you, and he will bring forgiveness to you. The other thing that I know that when I think about God and his holiness is that not only is God holy, but you know he's challenged you and I to be holy, to be like him. Peter said this in 1 Peter as he writes, chapter 1, verses 13 13 through 16. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all of your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old way of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now, but now that you do. Can I just amplify that a hair? Now that you know this, now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scripture says, you must be holy because I am holy. The God that you and I serve understanding that sin separated the world, but in his holiness, he came and provided a way for our sins to be forgiven, for us to be restored. It was the perfect sacrifice of his son. How did that change? What was the change that took place between the Old Testament covenant and where we are today? And that's where it leads me to this third image that I'm describing for you today, this veil of the temple being torn in two. The background of this, and you can read about this in Exodus chapter 26, we're actually going to look at Hebrews in just a moment, but as, think about this, when God raised up Moses and took the children of Israel out of bondage, they had lived in bondage 430 years, and he was taking them to the promised land. He raised up a type of Christ in Moses to bring them out, and in their journey in the wilderness, God also made a way by which they could worship him. He gave the command and told Moses exactly how they were to build the tabernacle, the temple, and how they were to worship and what components of that would be made up and how they would have to offer, the high priest would have to offer sacrifice for the people. And in those sacrifices, their sins would be forgiven. I want to read this to you from the book of Hebrews, however, in the New Testament that is reflecting back on this old covenant from Hebrews chapter 9. The first covenant that God made between Israel had regulations for worship and a place of worship here on the earth. There were two rooms in that tabernacle. The first room, in the first room, there was a lampstand, a table, sacred loaves of bread on the table, just describing what this looked like. The room was called the holy place. Then there was a curtain, there was a veil. And behind the curtain was a second room, and it was called the most holy place. And in that room were gold incense was a gold incense altar, a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant, which was covered with gold on all sides. And inside the Ark was the golden jar containing manna, Aaron's staff that sprouted leaves and stone tablets of the covenant. Above the Ark were the cherubim and divine glory, whose wings stretched out over the Ark's covenant, place of atonement. But we cannot explain all of these things in detail now. But when these things were all in one place, The priests regularly entered the first room, and as they performed their religious duties, but only the high priest ever entered the most most high place, and only once a year. And he always offered blood sacrifices for his sins and for the sins the people had committed. And by these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed, listen to this, that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system that it represented were still in use. We understand this is an illustration pointing to a present time. For the gifts and the sacrifices the priests offered were not able to cleanse the conscience of the people who bring them. For that old system deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies, physical regulations that were in effect only until a better system or a better covenant could be established. You know, the book of Hebrews itself is really just a story of how Christ came to give you and I a better covenant. In the old covenant, he's just 
He's sharing with us some of the restrictions of the old covenant, the old way that God had provided for the people to be in relationship with him. But he said there's a better covenant that's coming, and that's the covenant that you and I walk in today because of Christ. So Christ, verse 11, he became the high priest over all the good things that have come. He entered into a greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands, not part of the created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered into the most holy place once and for all to secure our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think. Just think how much more the blood of Christ can purify our conscience from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. But by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sin. That is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people. So that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance that God has promised them. For Christ did, excuse me, Christ died to set us free from the penalty of sin that was committed under the first covenant. Sin separated mankind from God, and in his holiness, in his love for us, he's been in pursuit of you and I, and ultimately, it came together on that cross, in that grave, and in the resurrection, God opening up a new and better covenant. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is telling us. That which the old covenant could never do, Christ completed for us. And now you can walk in fullness of all that God has in store for you in perfect harmony and relationship, but here's The bottom line, the image that I have in my mind that I wanted to share with you today, the thing that changed everything was Christ making a way for you and I to boldly walk in to his presence anytime you want. God removed the barrier. He destroyed that which separated us from him. He provided Jesus who shed his blood, the perfect lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Why? Because he loves you. His love has no limits. Oftentimes, we're the ones who put limits on God's love. Well, he couldn't possibly love me, Pastor. You don't know how I've lived my life. You don't know the things that I've done. You don't know the people I've hurt. You don't know the sin I've committed. Listen, Jesus' blood is perfect. Jesus' love is perfect God's love for you sent Christ to give his life for us. For God so loved the world. Pastor Jim shared this, that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but would have eternal or everlasting life. It was perfect. It was complete. And in the moment when Jesus gave up his last breath, he said, what it is finished, that veil was torn in two. In his sacrifice on the cross, Jesus made a way. He opened the door for you and I to not only be forgiven, you and I can daily live our lives in God's presence. And I love this statement because today we probably understood this better than we have in the past. You have unlimited, full access to the throne of the Father. Hebrews tells us this. Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 22. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have this great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty conscience have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Jesus paid the price. Jesus made a way for you to have full access to the Father. I was thinking about this, and you know, if if I could take you back for just a moment, think about a time when, and we've seen this on television and other uh, venues, but you see and think about a king who sits on a throne, right? King is royalty. In his kingdom, In the throne room, when he's sitting on his throne, not everyone would have access to that room, would they not? Oftentimes, that was reserved for a select few. Sometimes it was advisors or potentially maybe other 
kings or people of royalty who might be visiting. But as a whole, people did not have access to the throne. If they were giving or if they were taken into the throne room, actually at times if a common person like you and I were taken into the throne room, that was not going to be a good day. Right? Because at times that was typically for one purpose and that was to execute judgment. What Jesus did is provided you and I access. And it was kind of like this. Paul, there's a scripture that Paul gives us, and I'm going to close with this here in just a moment. But Paul writes a scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, they've become a, thank you, church, a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. I think, Pastor Jim, I was thinking about this. I think sometimes even when we've accepted Christ and we know we've accepted Christ, we still at times struggle with who we are or who we perceive ourselves to be. Why? Because I talked about this adversary earlier, Satan. He is one who's always wanting to remind you of your past. He's the one that always wants to point out your imperfections and your sin. He's always there whispering in your ear. He's always there trying to deceive and to tempt you. And I think at times, even as believers, sometimes we struggle with our identity. And certainly when we don't know Christ, we don't really truly understand what happens at the point we say yes to Christ and we become that new creation. We are hesitant to enter into the presence of God. We don't feel worthy to do that. There's a lot of, um, in our modern culture today, we talk about DNA testing, right? You'll see that even on crime shows on TV to try to identify who someone might be. They do genetic or DNA testing. DNA testing always will lead you right to that person, right? You can't deny the DNA results, right? Can I help you out? Connect that to 2 Corinthians 5.17. When you were born, when I was born into the world, I came in, and my DNA was that I was a sinner. If you tested my DNA before Christ, it would say, you don't belong to him. He's holy. But here's what happens. When you accept Jesus, that DNA is turned upside down. That sin nature is removed from you. Christ himself puts his DNA in you. The blood of Christ now covers that sin. That blood of Christ cleanses you from that sin nature. And the DNA now, when someone pulls your DNA and they want to test that DNA, they look at that and they go, child of God. Redeemed, restored, delivered. The doorway to the throne, into the presence of the Heavenly Father, the Creator of the earth, is open to you because you share, this is my son, this is my daughter. That's the one aspect that you and I as believers today have to get, we have to catch that, we have to own that because the veil has been rent in two and we have full access into the presence of God. At any moment, we just have to want it. You have to choose to walk in that place of forgiveness. Listen, we celebrate Easter because on this day, it's the greatest victory the world has ever known. Sin was conquered. Death was defeated. The grave is empty. And there's access to the Father. Don't live a defeated life. Don't live short of all that God has for you. Don't let your identity be determined by the world's system. Hey, it's messed up. But God's love for you and I is perfect, and he desperately wants you to walk with him. It's kind of interesting. Chris, you guys can come back to the platform. It's kind of interesting when you look at the story of Mark that tells uh, the end of um, Christ's life on the cross. It's kind of interesting. It just says here in verse 37 that Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last breath. Mark didn't really pen what Jesus cried out, but John does. John tells us exactly what Jesus cried out in John 19. He said, when Jesus had tasted the wine, he uttered these words. 
it is finished. It is finished. The Greek word for finished here is the, the Greek word to telestai. And it simply means this, and they understood it very clearly in their culture of the day. It was complete. It meant complete. It meant the debt was complete. It had been paid in full. They would actually write that when they were giving a receipt for a debt who had been honored, paid in full to tell us that it is finished. And on that cross, Jesus uttered those words. It is finished. Now the question becomes for you and I, what will we do? What will we do with this gift that Christ has provided for us? What will we do with this access to the Father? Access to the Father is for those who've said yes to his Son. So I would like to invite you to stand this morning. My prayer is that if you've never said yes to Christ, my prayer would be that this would be the day. Understanding, yes, we're all born into this world sinners, but Christ died so that we wouldn't stay that way. And some might say, well, Pastor, I'm really just not even sure how that works. Don't know what that even fully means. Here's what I would tell you. I gave you a scripture earlier, and I said, faith pleases God. It's just simply making a decision to acknowledge Christ as God's son, to acknowledge the gift of life that he provides for you, and to receive by faith his salvation. So I want to pray over you this morning. And as we bow our heads and we close our eyes, if you're here this morning and you've never acknowledged Jesus, the sacrifice on the cross, the place of surrender at the cross, if you've never done that, I would invite you today, if that's you, would you pray with me? Pray along with me, and let's just pray this prayer today. Let's make Jesus, make a decision today. Let's change our DNA. Let's come to know him in a very personal way. Father, as we pray this morning, we thank you for the gospel, the good news, the opportunity we have to celebrate today. Lord, it is my earnest prayer that if there are those this morning, even within the sound of my voice, maybe they're struggling right now, they don't even know what that fully means or comprehends, what it means to surrender their life to Christ. But I know this, I know the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a teacher. The Holy Spirit will draw us. And so, Father, I pray that today, that this would be the day that they would say yes to Christ. And a prayer of repentance might simply sound like this. Father God, I want to acknowledge Jesus today as your son. I want to surrender my life to him. I accept the forgiveness for my sin. And then today, Father, I thank you that I, I am now a new creation. That old man is gone, and I have been born again. Father, I pray that for those that may have prayed that prayer, that they would understand the significance of this moment that you would start them on a journey to become like Christ, that you would connect them to the body of Christ in such a way that they would continue to mature and grow in their walk with you. Lord, I also want to pray this morning. Maybe there are those who've been believers, they've accepted Christ, but it's really just been a struggle to understand how much you love them, and maybe they just really struggle to know that you they have access into your presence. Today, Father, I pray, They pray that just in a new way, they would recognize the freedom that they have now to talk with you, to walk with you, to understand their identity and who they are now as a child of God. 
no longer bound by the things of this world that so easily at time trip us up. Let us walk with you. Let us acknowledge you. And I praise you and thank you for this prayer now in Jesus' name. Amen. In a moment, we're going to close with a final worship song. Our prayer partners are going to be at the altar. Maybe you would like to pray with someone. Maybe you're here and you're wanting and have made a decision and prayed that prayer with me. Like Jesus is your Savior, but we want to pray with you. Or you're here this morning and you have a need. Our prayer team would love to pray with you. And then as the body of Christ, I leave you with this. I read a statement. It was written a number of years ago by a pastor and author. The gentleman's name was Rick Warren. And he says this, Jesus did not die on the cross so that we could live comfortable, well-adjusted lives. His purpose was much deeper than that. He wants us, he wants to make us like himself before he takes us to heaven. This is our greatest privilege. It is our immediate responsibility and it is our ultimate destiny. So for you and I as the church today, as we celebrate Jesus, let's remember why we walk with him. It's a privilege. It is an ultimate and immediate responsibility for us to be like him. Because it is our ultimate destiny. We love you. We appreciate you. We pray the blessing of God over you. May he bless you, keep you. May he be gracious to you. May the Father lift up his countenance upon you and fill you with his abundant peace.